Coming up on Activate Live, find out which states are trying to suppress workers' rights and how you can get the information you need to fight back. Federal workers are under attack. What to know about probation and the U.S. Forest Service's Job Corps Civilian Conservation Centers. That's next on Activate Live. Activate your voice. Activate it now. Voice activation. Live from Maryland. This is Activate Live. Welcome to Activate Live. I'm Tanya Hutchins with the Machinist Union. We're going to tell you about a tool that you can use to educate yourself about state laws and how they affect you and your job. The Economic Policy Institute recently released a study about workers' rights preemption in the United States. EPI's website includes an interactive map that allows you to search by state so you can search for the state where you live. Joining us to talk about this interactive feature is Marvie Von Wolpert from EPI. Marnie was our very first guest on Activate Live in September, and we'd like to welcome her back. Thanks, Marnie. It's great to be here. And yes, we have been tracking what are called preemption laws in the states, and preemption means when a higher form of government passes a law that supersedes a lower form of government. So the federal government can pass laws superseding the states, and states can pass laws superseding their cities. But what we've seen lately is a rise in preemption of conservative state legislatures passing laws to overrule their local cities' labor standards. And so we had in St. Louis, for example, in August, St. Louis raised the minimum wage in their city above $7.25 an hour, which the federal government has kept as a very low minimum wage across the country since 2009. And they raised it to $10 an hour after they had many hearings at their city council. Bills were drafted and debated, and they passed it through their own democracy. But that's when the state legislature came down and said, nope, minimum wage is only something state governments can do and lowered the money workers are getting from $10 an hour back to $7.70 in late August. So we're seeing this happen quite often and we've been wanting to keep an eye on it. That is such a blow to workers. Which states are some that fared the worst? Often most of the states that are more conservative in terms of their government structures in the South have fared the worst. But we're seeing an alarming trend of preemption happening in northern states such as Michigan, for example. In 2015, Michigan issued preemption laws on minimum wage, paid leave, fair scheduling, prevailing wage, and product labor agreements, meaning that no city or county government in Michigan, if they wanted to raise standards for workers on their own, can no longer do that. We're seeing other preemption bills come up in states that primarily have Republican trifectas, in which both chambers of the state legislature are controlled by Republicans and the governor is as well. That's where most of these harmful worker preemption bills are coming into play. And this is a new trend in preemption, that preemption in general can be used for good. For example, the federal minimum wage or the National Labor Relations Act or Title VII of the Civil Rights Act says that no state can go below these minimum protections. So generally preemption is used as a floor, but we've seen it since about 2010 when the Republicans won a bunch of the state legislators, legislatures, they're now using preemption as a ceiling to not allow workers to improve their rights. And that's been the most harmful part of this process. Tell us what factors are at play, because you already mentioned some of the things that you look at, like minimum wage, um, also some of the agreements, um, project labor agreements. What are the factors that you looked at in each state? We are tracking five basic labor laws that we're looking at, which are minimum wage, paid sick days, which could be sick or family leave, product labor agreements, uh, prevailing wage and fair scheduling laws. And so a lot of states are trying to learn in cities to play with their fair scheduling laws to make sure that workers who have to close one shift aren't required to come back seven hours later and open the same store the next day. Well, in a place like Michigan or Florida, you can no longer do that at the city level. And the argument that a lot of these states are using is, well, we want uniform standards all throughout the state. Well, then the state itself could raise workers' rights if they wanted to do so, but they're not. They're actually lowering them back down. And we saw that with the paid sick leave ordinance in Milwaukee. In 2008, the voters of Milwaukee voted overwhelmingly, almost 70% voted to allow paid sick time off in their city. But in 2011, the government, the state legislature, knocked it back down and took that away from all of the workers. 
Now, you noticed a trend. You know, why did the trend of blocking local labor, labor laws pick up in 2013? So there is a group called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and it's a very conservative, very wealthy and highly funded uh, conservative lobbying group. And it's co funded by the Koch brothers, the Bradley Foundation, same folks who fund the National Right to Work Defense Council. They started pushing a bill, a model bill in 2013 called the Paid or the Living Wage Model Preemption Act going around to state legislators, telling them you need to preempt all these cities from raising the minimum wage. And it tracks a lot of the Fight for 15 movement, where we see successes from Fight for 15, we soon see preemption bills from the state knocking them back down. So that's when they first started really pushing this whole model preempt living wage preemption act. And that's when we saw all of these bills start to shoot through the roof. Marnie, do you have any advice for people using the map. We have people who are union members who are, are watching us now and even non-union members, so all workers. Um, and as people know, unions are trying to help everyone in the workplace. Any advice for um, people who come to your site? Yes, one, uh, to get educated on the laws that have already possibly passed in your state. So I got a great question from a local in Philadelphia who called and said, we want to do a local minimum wage bill. And I said, well, you can't because Pennsylvania has a minimum wage preemption law. And so first getting educated to know if these rights have been taken away from our local governments. But second, we have a link to the actual text of each state law in that map, and it shows who passed it which party was in control and who the sponsors of these bills were. And it's been a pretty per pernicious to see who the sponsors of a lot of these bills are, because a lot of it happens in cities that are primarily run by minority and people of color, such as in Birmingham, Alabama, when they raise their minimum wage and a primarily white state legislature is then knocking them back down. So the NAACP has actually filed suit against the state of Alabama saying that it's racial animus and trying to take away our local government rights to raise our minimum wage. And they are able to do these things because they know who's passing this and why. So that's a really great tool in the map to use. Anything else you want people to know? Just to keep an eye on this. And also a lot of people ask me in our state, should, you know, we're not preempted yet. Should we try and pass a local paid sick days law at our city level? Or will that trigger a preemption fight from the state legislature? My answer is, a lot of conservative lobbying groups are there trying to get these passed regardless of whether or not workers stand up for their rights. And it's a lot harder to take something away than it is to prevent it from happening in the first place. So I would advise people, stand up for your rights, go to your city governments, pass the laws you need, and then make the legislature fight to take them away. Thank you so much, Marnie. We appreciate your time. And thanks again for being our first guest ever. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Well, what do you think about workers' rights in your state? Let us know by making a comment. And you can always make a comment here on Facebook. Uh, we have replays later on on Twitter and YouTube. Um, so then you can comment there as well. If you're on Twitter, just hit the reply button and talk to us. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem at all. Now, there are lots of issues of concerns when it comes to working people and how the labor movement can help. You know, federal employees make the government work. The IAM represents federal employees throughout the country. And joining us now is the Director of Government Employees, Jim Price, who is here to talk to us a little bit about a tax on federal workers. Absolutely. Um, we have this awful tax bill um, that is going through right now. Um, and tell us a little bit about your first impression of that bill, because there are people on both sides of the aisle that have problems with it. Yeah, well, first off, I'm glad to be back here on the show. Uh, Thanks. Next thing I guess it is, is with the tax bill. I mean, you know, I, I think that people don't understand having read the bill. If you haven't read it, you need to go online and read it, because it does impact uh, those folks who make under $100,000 adversely. Uh, I'm not a real legislative person. I do, un I do understand legislation. But this piece of legislation, this tax bill, is just not for working people, trust me. Tell us a little bit about um, one thing that we were talking about is a new act, and it's called the Ensuring a Qualified Civil Service Act of 2017. Um, what does that act do if it passes? Well, essentially what it does is it, it, <laughs> it, uh, it extends the probationary period for new hires in the federal sector from one year two years. In most 
That seems really long. Yeah, and, and most jobs that I've ever had, most jobs that anybody's ever had, uh, three months to six months right. is the normal probationary period. This, in essence, makes a, a, a built-in labor force that's, that's temporary. It's a temporary workforce. And if you can't determine what an employee is capable of doing or if you can't say that this employee is, is, uh, can make it in three months, to, three months to six months, let alone a year, then there's really no reason to change the law. Why? You're, all you're doing is building in that workforce so that you can basically say you're gone or hire more people. It, it's, it's, it's a sham. It's really a sham. So, you know, if anybody asks what's really going on here, you think that underlying uh, I, I tell you theme what, is yeah. to try and make temporary Temporary employees. workers. That's, that's all the federal government's looking for. Our federal government has become the biggest right-to-work uh, entity in this country right now, and specifically with the federal workers. As I said on the show before, uh, the federal workforce makes up probably 10 to 11 percent of the total unionized workforce in this country, whereas you've got like maybe 5 to 6 percent is private public sector, I guess, you know, with uh, your, your large corporations. If, in fact, they can take down the federal sector, guess who's next? This is not just a federal workers' fight. This is a workers' fight. So we have to not just think in terms of right now and no. living in the moment. We have to think about future workers. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to keep that focus. We need to focus on the fact that right to work just isn't a bill that may pop up in a state. Right to work is our federal government. We need to change labor law in this country. And until we do, uh, we're going to have these types of battles. Okay, so we have to remind people, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the attack on federal workers. They're the ones that make the government work. Um, and we have Jim Price here with us, who is the IAM um, Government Employees Director. And Jim is talking about some of these attacks on federal workers. We've talked about the tax bill. And what we were just talking about was the Ensuring a Qualified Civil Service Act of 2017. There's also funding um, for lots of different entities, and when it comes to the U.S. Forest Service, um, we have, and I'm, I have the three C's here, the Job Corps Civilian Conservation Centers throughout the country. Yes. What is going on with that proposed funding? First off, I'd like to give a shout out to Beverly Ford from our Forest Service unit who uh, put together a really nice impact statement uh, in regards to how the cuts to this particular uh, operation are going to impact our members, and not only our members, it impacts the communities. Uh, she Ford. Yeah, she talks about, uh, in her impact statement, she talks about uh, how the uh, JCCC employs 50 to 70 per percent of the people yep. uh, in each community. She talks about uh, how they spend an average of $5.5 .5 million in annual budget each year on goods and services in each community. Our communities are being impacted because they will not fund all of these centers. Currently, what's going on right now, the director of the of the uh, of, uh, DOL, I guess, that handles these particular centers has funded the private sector, but has not funded the government sector centers. And all these all these figures that basically you'll see or that I've mentioned, uh, it impacts our members. It impacts our NIFIM members, and that's just not right and they provide a service that's necessary. Yeah, even uh, that we have on the screen now, they serve an average of 5,300 at-risk and disabled students. Yes. They serve an average of 212 graduating students each year, okay. um, and that will have an impact if Absolutely. the centers aren't there. And, and I tell you, we need to contact our congressmen and our senators to let them know that this is just not right, that basically they would impact these, these underprivileged children in these areas and a lot of these kids come from rural areas it's not just kids out of the city it's rural areas that basically are impacted uh, so you know today i guess i would probably if i had a message to get out to everybody out there call your congressmen and senators talk about the tax bill talk about how it impacts you and we have a phone number i think I of one number that people can call okay um, i know there are a lot of different numbers but you can look up the number for your um, senator you can look up any of your constituents. And here we have a tax and budget legislative hotline here, 1-888-899-9913. I think it's 844. 1-844, thank you, Jim. See, it's a good thing you're sitting here. 1-844-899-9913. Yeah, this is all important. And talk about, you know, when you call, you can call and talk about the economic impact of getting rid of these uh, 
these centers. I mean, it's just amazing how that works. And then specifically the Equal Equals Act, uh, uh, House uh, Resolution 4182, you need to call on that as well. I, like I said, I'm not a legislative guy, but I do follow the legislatures that impact our federal employees, and we need to. And you could read the bills online. Oh, absolutely. Read we need them. to get, we got to get into the fight. It's all about working people. That's right. We want to make sure everyone has the information that they need. That's right. Anything else you want to tell us about federal employees? Uh, right now, we're doing quite well. We, we, Like I said, this year we've had a conference that was a, a great success. Uh, we basically have uh, uh, a lot of things going on inside the federal sector with the IAM and also NIFI uh, Federal District 1 IAM. Uh, there's some conferences coming up, uh, organizing summits that we're going to have at the, at the Whitman Senior Center to talk about organizing inside the federal sector. Uh, it's just been a whirlwind. It's been two years now. Wow. And Time we're, flies. We're leaving it better than what we found it. That's, that's always the goal. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. We'd also like to give a shout out to our new organizing director that was just announced, uh, Vinny Adeo. Adio, Vinny Adio. He says Adio. Yeah. I'm going to say it the way he wants us to say it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now my New York accent's going to come out again. So congratulations to Vinny Adio. You can send us your comments at any time. Um, we're live on Facebook, and then we have um, replays later on on Twitter and on YouTube. And we always like to hear from you, our viewers. So let us know what you think about these attacks on federal workers. And also let us know uh, what you think about um, the Economic Policy Institute's interactive map that we started out with at the beginning of the show that shows us uh, um, the preemptive laws in each state. So search your state and let us know what you think. Also let us know where you're watching from. Joining us now is communications. Representative Delane Adams. Delane, how are you? Hi, Tanya. How are you doing today? Good. Now, we've been talking to, um, I'm forgetting him already. I have some time received. Jim Price, Jim Price yes. about federal <laughs> workers, the attack on federal workers, the tax bill that's out there. I know you have some thoughts on that as well. We had a letter that went out recently, didn't we? Yeah, we had a letter from President Martinez um, really urging members of Congress to vote against this plan. Um, this is a plan, again, that encourages corporations to outsource jobs and take them overseas. So this is bad for, for not only union members, but working people everywhere. So, um, so we're very proud of the letter um, that was uh, initiated by our legislative department. Um, it's coming from President Martinez to members of Congress, urging them to vote no. And we urge everyone out there listening to vote no on this too. And you also have some news about some young workers. Oh, so proud of the young workers from Local 63, young workers, <laughs> young machinists. That's what we like to see. Uh, raising funds, raising funds for foster children in Oregon. Um, you know, raising funds to actually provide Christmas trees um, for, for the foster children and their families, but also gifts. Uh, and also other members of Local 63 will helping out with uh, donation of toys, ornaments, uh, just different things. I mean, this is... This is a, a good example of what we really need uh, with IAM is to make sure that we have everybody working together to, uh, to do what we need to do for the community. And like I said, the young workers at Local 63 and then young workers everywhere. Uh, we do so many great things and mm -hmm. this is a good venue to let people know about it. I know a lot of times people in the general public don't really hear a lot about unions um, only when something you know bad happens and we want to show people that we're not only fighting for justice on the job but service to the community that's yeah. part of our mantra perfect example yeah, so, yeah. and we, you also want to remind people that they can always contact their member of Congress yes always contact your member of Congress um, you can always go to our website and we can help direct you um, to you know who your representative is and who your senator is so uh, again resources are there for you um, whatever we need to do in order for you to um, participate. So we have action alerts. We usually give you the numbers that you need, yeah. you know, on the website. Any other news you'd like to tell us about? No, just, you know, it's uh, my Thanksgiving was, was great. You know, awesome. Plenty of ham, plenty of turkey. That's so, great. Yeah, that's Union made Thanksgiving. That's yes. how we made it. Yes. Okay. So. Thanks so much for joining us, Delane. Right. Thank you. We appreciate it. So, everybody, we would like to thank everyone who's making a comment, because you can always at any time let us know what you think by making comments, and we have lots of people joining us. Um, we have from Sacramento, California, 
Deborah Sharkey is joining us. Frank Saptel is joining us. Robert Nofsiger, I hope I said that correctly. Carlos Gu, Oaklawn, Illinois. Let's see who else. Deanna Woma, Womax, Womack. Uh, Jim Reed, Brian Collis, hey. Frank Saptel, watching from Toronto. So thank you all for joining us. Keep the comments coming, and thank you to anyone who has shared this video. We're going to look at what's coming up ahead this month. Um, we've been telling you this month about Guide Dogs of America. Well, it has a graduation coming up December 16th. And from what I understand, this is a photo of the 400th class. So those are the members there that are going to graduate December 16th. Congratulations to all of the pending graduates. We are so proud of you and proud of the work that you're able to do as team members. December 16th is also Wreaths Across America a service project in which people lay wreaths at national cemeteries, including Arlington National Cemetery, that's where I'm going to be, and more than 1,200 additional locations in all 50 states. We have machinists taking part in this all across the country, at sea, and abroad. So we hope you take part to remember our fallen veterans and honor those who serve. And if you like what you've seen today, please share this video, keep commenting, and we are going to see you next Wednesday for Activate Live. You can always watch the replays on YouTube or Twitter. See you then.